Hi, my name is Arvashi Reddy, and I am a software engineer at Pinterest. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about designing CI pipelines with Bazel queries in mind. Pinterest is an application that allows users to save ideas from the internet. Our company mission is to bring everyone the inspiration to create the life they love. We have over 400 million users using the application today. And within our engineering org, we have about a thousand engineers helping to develop Pinterest. The team that I work on is called the engineering productivity team. Our mission is to build a developer platform that inspires developers to do their best work. We like to think of a developer's journey as one that boils down into three main pillars, code, build, and deploy. In this talk, I'll focus on what code and build is at Pinterest and how we use Bazel to create a better experience for our developers. We decided to migrate over from using B Maven to Bazel a couple of years ago, and there were a lot of lessons learned during that process. I highly encourage you to check out my colleague Eden Jean Baptiste's talk on Pinterest's journey to a Bazel mono repo, so you can learn all about those lessons and have a, have a deep dive into what that journey was like for us. That talk will be available at BazelCon tomorrow morning. Okay, so let's talk about what coding and building looks like at Pinterest and where we first were when we migrated to Bazel. Pinterest uses uh, mono repos. It's what I call mono repo ish. Um, technically, the word mono repos is an oxymoron since a mono repo is a single repository that stores all of your code and assets for every project. But what we have is a few repos that are grouped by language and they're fairly large. For example, our Java mono repo, uh, mono repo houses 250 services and they have common code that is shared between those services. This Java repo is actually where we first started our Bazel migration. Moving over to build, our team manages continuous integration environments and it outputs the build artifacts. Our CI uses what we call a dispatcher model, which is really simple. All the dispatcher model means is that it, the first step that the CI is going to take is to figure out what are the incoming changes, what we need to run, and dispatch that work to workers that run in parallel. What this looked like when we migrated to Bazel was, to, in our Java repo specifically, was a really large Python script that needed to figure out which projects were affected by the incoming code changes. The script would then call the targets defined within the particular project. There were a few problems with this approach. For one, the Python script was really complicated. It had to handle a lot of edge cases, like what to do when there's a change in the shared code. And so it quickly became very unwieldy. It also did not help that it was untested. It was difficult for our team to make changes and to update it when we needed to. Secondly, when the script could not determine which projects were which projects targets were to run, it would fall back to building everything, which was really expensive. So in our Java repo, we had 250 services and over 7,000 Bazel targets. Frequently building all of those was causing an unnecessarily delay in our CI feedback cycle and not bringing our developers a whole lot of joy. Lastly, we couldn't apply the, the script to any of our other larger repos that we were migrating to Bazel with. It was specific to this Java repo and it was specific to some of the projects within them because of its approach to figure out which, which project was affected and then thus running the targets within them. So it was very much time to update our query tooling and our CI for Bazel. We had a few requirements that we already knew going into the going into the new approach. Um, one of them would be that we needed it to continue to be self-service. We did not want to have our developers have to write any special config that dictated what about their service would run in CI. We only wanted them to focus on implementing their service and have enough Bazel knowledge to be able to construct their build file. And also this information about what they wanted to run in the build file literally existed in the build file itself. So we should have been able to, we should be able to leverage that without having them to write additional functionality for CI. We also needed faster builds and reproducible builds. Um, I mentioned that we were frequently building all, and also if we need to do any sort of investigations about why a CI failure was happening, reproducibility was gonna be really important. Um, and lastly, in order for us to scale our migration to Bazel and just to have consistent tooling across that would make it really easy for our team to manage, um, we needed to be able to apply this new tooling to any, any of our major repos, um, regardless of anything that was inside of them. So the first thing that we did was replace the Python script with a Golang CLI called Build Collector. Build Collector takes in two git commit shaws and outputs the minimal set of affected Bazel targets. It does this by running Bazel queries to figure out which targets were affected. It's much simpler and it's not repo or project specific. And the best part is that it's tested so we can make changes and not worry about regression. So the way Build Collector works is that it has an understanding of what types of files have changed 
And this boils down for us into five change types. So we have if the workspace file changed, the build file changed, or the extension file changed. Those three are just Starlock rules that are in, common in the repository. The other thing we want to handle for is deleted files. What Which set of targets should be run if a file is deleted? And lastly, the most common one, which is just a source file has changed. So let's figure out the affected targets for that change. So let's take a closer look at what Bazel Query's build collector is running for each type of file change. Um, I, I should also mention that the queries on the slide deck are not necessarily syntactically correct and have been uh, very much simplified to just make sure that everything uh, fits on the slide deck and looks nice. But okay, so let's look at if a workspace file was changed. The scope of impact for when a workspace file change is pretty much everything in the repo. So we run a very simple query that returns all the test targets um, that's outlined there. So that's just basal query, everything in the repo. If it's a build file that's changed, then the scope of impact that we care about is every target that's defined within the build file and anything that depends on them. So to get that information, we would need to run two queries. The first one is a set query that just returns the build labels. This is, tell me, I'm giving you the build files that have changed. Basil query, tell me what the build labels are, what the corresponding ones are. We can then take that first part of the build label that was returned to us and suffix it with a colon all in order to get all of the targets that were defined within that build file. Notice we are also using the rdeps query function, which returns the reverse dependencies of those targets. These two set of queries is what ends up being the basis of what we run for our next two queries as well, which is nice for us to be able to reuse a lot of this logic in build collector, making sure that it's still simple. Um, OK, so let's look at extension changes. We need to know what build files are loading the extension files, and that will give us the scope of impact that we're looking for in this case. We use what's called a sky query. Um, and a sky query is just like a basal query, but it has a couple of extra flags on it to make it into a sky query. And what we use it for is to be able to find all the build files that are loading this extension. Once we have the list of build files, we can simply run the same set of build change queries that we have above to be able to know what targets were in them and what were, what, if any targets are depending on them. OK, for deleted files, we find all of the parent directories of the deleted file and the build files within each directory. So we're simply walking up the tree and finding all the build files that could have been referencing this deleted file. We then run the build change queries from the previous side because we've gotten now pretty much the same thing we needed, which was the build files and the targets within them and then anything that depended on them. Lastly, the simplest query we run is for the source file changes. We take the list of files that have changed and pass them to our depths um, query function in order to get all of the targets dependent on that source file. And that's pretty much it. Those are the, the meat of what Build Collector is running. Let's take a, a step back and go to CI um, and think about what stages we want to, uh, to achieve in order to have confidence in the changes that are coming in, the code changes that are coming in. So the first thing we want to do is we want to test the code and we want to test the right targets that are coming in. Um, we only want to run test targets. Uh, then we need to compile the release ar artifacts that we then plan to publish in a later stage. This is important feedback to have as a second stage since our repos have shared common code. So we want to make sure that they are all compiled together correctly and that there aren't any issues where one change in a shared library code has impacted other artifacts that um, are not able to compile and thus later on failing in the publish stage. And lastly, once we have that confidence, we can finally just uh, publish the artifacts that we care about in CI. So how do we construct our queries for the stages that we want and the outcomes that should happen in each of the stages? For the test stage, we can actually take the queries that we have uh, previously before for each file change type and wrap them around a filter query that will only give us back test targets. And there's two ways that we can do that. We can either uh, filter these out by using a kind query function and, and give it a, a simple regular expression that says, I want everything that has underscore test, uh, that is an underscore test rule type, because those, that's what uh, Bazel has a, a for test targets, or we can um, we can use the tests query function, uh, which will basically do exactly the same thing. It will filter out only test targets, uh, but either one will get get us the the outcome that we're looking for, and that will give us the test targets that we care about for the test stage. For build and release targets, we do something a little bit more interesting. Notice that our query is doing the same thing. We're taking the queries that were before the file change queries, and we're wrapping them around a kind, kind function. But what we're filtering out instead is artifact CI release rules. 
what's Artifact CI release rules? This is actually a custom release macro that we have written for publishing release artifacts at Pinterest. So how does that work exactly? Um, in order to explain that, I kind of have to explain a, a lot more about what we've done in, custom in the custom release macro space at Pinterest. So our Pinterest developers are creating a wide range of release artifacts. We have jars, Kate's manifest files, Docker images, and deployment tarballs. Um, in order for them to be able to publish uh, the, in Pinterest fashion and all these different things that they, uh, all these different types of release that we have, their build file would end up being really long. And so we wanted to make sure that they had a better experience writing those build, those rules in their build file. So we created custom release man, uh, macros that essentially generated all of these rules. And these rules boil down to two types of rules, which are the push and manifest rules. So push rules are the actual things that we're uploading, the, the artifacts themselves, for example, um, a, a Docker image going to a registry or a, a jar that's being uploaded to S3. Those push rules are often referenced by a manifest rule. So manifest rule is like a K8 spec um, that is referencing the Docker image that it cares about and, and is versioned at specifically. So we have this constraint happening where we need to make sure that push rules are uploaded, are run first before manifest rules are, are run. Um, so now we can simply do this in Bazel. Bazel, we could query uh, the rules and we can set up the dependencies uh, correctly and make sure that always push rules are run right after manifest rules. Uh, but what we found was that it was getting really, what we found was that things were getting really slow and it was harder for Build Collector to be performant in, in querying these things because there was a lot of different push and release rules that were generated by our custom macros. The other thing I want to mention is that all of these release rules have two use cases. Um, they have the CI use case, which is the one that we're talking about in this talk and we care about, which is you know creating these blessed artifacts that are mainly for production environments and pr production CD uh, stages. But there's also the dev use case where uh, people who are at the at their local uh, developers who are using it locally who want to be able to just create a local build and um, be able to uh, not impact not deploy it on production but do some local testing of their own. So once we found out that these release queries were taking a really long time in Build Collector, we thought, okay, we need another release abstraction that's specific for CI, but still has that same outcome for the for users who are using this at the local level. And that's when we came up with Artifact CI release and Artifact Dev release. Uh, both Artifact CI release and Artifact Dev release uh, control the execution of push and manifest rules. So now we're no longer relying as much on Bazel to be able to tell us what is the dependency order because we have a, a, a clear understanding of push rules and manifest rules at Pinterest that need to run in that order. And so we can simply subdivide them, pass them to Artifact CI or Dev Release, and they can do that execution for us. This made querying in Build Collector a lot faster. So let's take a look at uh, what the build file looks like uh, and what developers are actually writing. Here we have a custom release rule called container release, and it's actually achieving a lot of things. The first thing is you'll see in that images key value map is a reference to a Docker image that uh, they want to publish over to a registry. The second item there is a Teletran tarball, which is an open source um, deployment environment that we have called Teletran. And uh, that tarball helps us to deploy things to EC2 instances. And uh, the third thing is uh, K8's workload, a, a YAML file that is being given to Hermes. So it's called Hermes YAMLs and Hermes is our uh, Pinterest solution for deploying K8's workloads, right? So this developer has a container release rule. It's really common. They have a K8's workload, they have an EC2 deploy that they need to do, um, and they have a Docker image that they need to publish. So all of that gets just defined right here. And what actually gets generated is then consumed by RCI. What's generated here is um, the release target that it corresponds to what the developer wrote in the build file themselves. So this is the one that they'll recognize. And we always alias that to the dev rule just to make sure that they are running the dev rule um, um, if they do run this target locally. Then we also have the CI version of this rule, which is run by Build Collector. So Build Collector is the only thing that cares about this CI rule, so that abstraction is hidden away from users. We also have the uh, the dev rule as well, which is just uh, the redundant rule that is created from um, Artifact dev release. Let's put that all together. 
so we have the CI, uh, we have the CI stages and we have uh, build collector, but we need to now construct our CI itself. So the first stage that we want to do is actually run build collector so we know which targets we need to run. And so for this, we have two commands that we're running in what I call the analysis stage. Uh, build collector get test targets, and we simply pass the directory, which is the directory to the repo path, the two git commit shaws, which are previous and latest commit, as well as where we want build collector to output its list of targets. And that's always going to be a JSON file that we've listed as test targets.json for the test targets and release targets.json for the release targets. We then can actually get to the meat of our CI, which is the test build and release stages. And what we'll do is pull the list of targets out from that JSON file and pass it over to Bazel test for the test stage, Bazel build for the build stage, and Bazel run for the release stage. All right, so stepping back and looking at what we've been able to achieve, um, we maintained that the build file is the contract between developers and CI. This is where they are dictating what needs to run in CI and we're leveraging that and not asking them to have to run, learn more things or specify more things for CI. Um, the other thing we've been able to do is to decrease CI build times. Um, we're no longer frequently uh, building all and we're uh, building the minimal set of basal targets in CI, which uh, has have had a lot faster feedback for developers. Um, we've also simplified publishing release artifacts. We talked about the custom rules um, and the ways that we've built abstractions for CI and the dev use case. And lastly, and something that's really going to help our team to be able to uh, continue with this approach is by having consistent CI tooling that we can apply to any of our repos that are migrating over to Bazel. So what's next for us? Um, one of the things that we really want to look into is automatic steps for uh, determining when flaky test targets are running and being able to tag them using Bazel tags and remove them out of the rotation for what runs in CI. Um, Bazel lends itself nicely for doing something like this. So um, we're, that's probably the next thing that we're going to explore. The other thing that we'd eventually like to get to is just to have one mono repo and truly use the definition of what mono repo is and have all repos in one space. Once we do that, we'll have uh, pretty much hit um, a scale in which we'll need to improve the query analysis performance in Build Collector. And there's a couple of ways that people are already actually doing this in the Bazel uh, community. I know of one, at least in the open source community, where they're using um, hashing to be able to get these uh, targets a lot faster. So that's something we'll probably explore in the later stages as well. Thank you so much for watching this talk. Um, I also want to say a big thank you to uh, our senior technical lead at Pinterest, James Fesh, who really helped a lot with these projects, as well as my team, the engineering productivity team, uh, both past and present members have really contributed a lot to make um, some of these things possible. Thank you. Mm -hmm.